greetings and welcome to today's presentation. Today's speaker is Dr. Mick Chardois with Teledyne Technologies. Teledyne is the world's premier developer of scientific detectors across the electromagnetic spectrum. Most recently, they provided 96% of the detectors on the James Webb Space Telescope. Mick received his PhD from Northwestern University in 1998 and has been active in the field of optics ever since, holding product development, sales and management positions in fiber optics, microscopic optics, and scientific imaging cameras. Today, he'll be speaking on the topic of quantum efficiency, one of the most important characteristics of any sensor detector. After today's presentation, everyone should have an understanding of this topic more fully and be able to use the knowledge to improve their observations. People will be muted during the presentation and will ask address any of the questions at the conclusion of Mick's talk, so please send your questions to the chat forum. Without further ado, Mick, you've got the floor. All right, thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, so it's a pleasure to be here today with everyone. And as, as Peter said, as I go through the talk, um, in order to just kind of keep things a little on schedule for everyone, I'm trying to keep things to about 20 minutes. So we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Please send your questions to Peter, and then we can go through on virtually any topic you'd like to cover, but of course, quantum efficiency being the top one. I'll just do a little bit of intro on, on who Teledyne is, and then we'll launch into sort of the meat of the science. Everyone probably knows us, but just in case you don't, I'll give a little bit of overview of, of who we are and what we do. So Teledyne is, is a pretty large company. And you know we're, we're listed on the, the stock exchange. We've got our own fabs. We do a lot of projects for NASA, um, among other things. And one of the things that, that sets us apart is we not only have the ability to build a camera out of things, but really everything from the, the semiconductor, fabricating that, and we'll talk about that a little bit today, all the way up through the, uh, the, the camera itself, we kind of cover all of the bases. <clears throat> Because of that, we've got a little bit of experience in space and earth science. Um, this is just kind of a summary of some of the missions that we've done. You know, so for example, earth observation, we've already flown 80 missions, 20 are underway. And the number of total years in space is one of the ones I like. You know, we can say we've been in space now for thousands of years when you add up all the time for all of the sensors. And we spent some time on, on planet as well. Um, the Perseverance used pretty much, with, with some short exceptions, all the spectrometers and detectors on that little guy are from Teledyne. And I won't dig into this too much because you're not here for, for sort of an ad, just want to let you know where we're coming from. And then as, as Peter was kind enough to mention, the James Webb Space Telescope is really something of a you know, large-scale passion project for Teledyne writ large. Um, the sensors that are on that were delivered you know, over a decade ago now to the, to the group doing the final integration. So it's been a long time in coming um, for us. And of course, we were really, really pleased to see everything unfold and you know, appear to all be working properly at this point, because it's not like we can fly a, a duplicate sensor up there if something goes wrong. But <clears throat> today we'll bring things a little more down to earth and we're gonna focus on quantum efficiency. Um, I'm going to give a lot of general information. So rather than focus, you know, again, like I said, I don't want to make this into an ad. You guys are here for the science. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff we do specifically at the end. But what I'm really here to focus on is, is what quantum efficiency is, why it matters to your science, where it comes from. Um, and we'll do some calculations to kind of show you that you can actually do some nice modeling to predict what kind of results you're going to get in any given situation as well. And so this is uh, hopefully by the end of today, you'll probably know more than you'd like to know about quantum efficiency and, and where it comes from. So we'll start with something that everyone has probably seen variants of before. And I'll just mention right now that pretty much everything I say today is going to be interchangeable between different types of silicon-based sensors. When it comes to quantum efficiency, whether we're talking about a CMOS sensor, CCD sensor, it's generally going to be the same. Um, so what you're seeing here is kind of a, a cartoon of what a typical sensor is going to look like for astronomy. There's individual pixels. This little blue layer on top represents 
the uh, electrode structure. And the electrode structure is what holds a charge across that pixel and makes this whole thing possible. The depleted region is where photoelectrons are created. And the bulk silicon is more or less like waste silicon that everything sits on top of. It doesn't, doesn't serve a useful function as far as making things happen. So where does quantum efficiency come from? Well, we have these little photons incident on the sensor that you can see in my cartoon here. And quantum efficiency is simply the percentage of the time that a given photoelectron um, becomes an electron inside um, the active region of the pixel. So you'll see here on this particular one, two out of the three photons, or excuse me, one out of the two photons that are incident are being detected. This one would have a quantum efficiency of 50%. And it's wavelength dependent. So some sensors will perform very well, let's say in the UV at 300 nanometers and perform very poorly um, in the visible range from 400 to 700 and vice versa. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. <clears throat> One thing that's good to know is that no matter how amazing you build your silicon-based sensor, it's going to be dead, essentially, 0% quantum efficiency above 1,100 nanometers. Um, that's the limit of where we can push silicon for detection and everything above 1,100 nanometers that you might see um, in the James Webb, for example, to use a previous example, is using a material other than silicon, commonly um, indium gallium arsenide or mercury, mercury cadmium telluride or a couple of the materials for longer wavelengths. And we're not gonna focus on that today. Um, since most everyone here is focused on the visible, um, I'm gonna try to focus on the visible as well. <clears throat> So let's talk about the first types of sensors ever developed. And we'll kind of go through a little bit of the history of sensors while we talk about quantum efficiency. First ones are what's called front illuminated. They're called front illuminated because this electrode structure that maintains the, uh, you know, the, the electrical charge over the pixel that makes it active is on the front side. That's the term front illuminated. Um, the problem with this kind of design is that you know, it works, which is great. At this point in time, when these were first being built, works was the goal. Um, but the problem is that a lot of the photons are gonna hit one of, one of those sort of circuits in the electrode structure and be reflected away. So typically front side illuminated or front illuminated devices have a maximum quantum efficiency of 50%. So you're basically throwing away half your photons. We think about it in astronomical terms, half the brightness of the star right, is what you're collecting. You're looking at a star that's half the magnitude that it otherwise would be. Um, most of the CMOS sensors that with global shutter, which is a bit of a trivia point here, are, well, not most, all are front illuminated. Um, but there's, there's a way to sort of solve this problem. So in the 1990s, originally designed for a type of new CCD that Sony made called Interline. That's the first you know, time I know of it being used, there was this idea that we can put little lenses, and that's what's shown in the blue here on this cartoon, in front of the, uh, the active pixel and use it to take photons that normally would hit the gate, as you see here on the left, there's some photons hitting the gate being reflected away. Now those photons are funneled into the pixel by the micro lens. So it's pretty cool. It's kind of amazing to me that, you know, a million times you can lay down this you know, array of lenses and position it over there with sub-micron accuracy and then glue it in place basically in such a way that it never comes off. It's kind of an amazing, amazing process to me. And, but you can do this and each of those little lenses then directs the light in and you get a higher quantum efficiency. Depending on, on how it's done and what the pixel is, you know, every device you see where the quantum efficiency is over 50%, unless it's back illuminated, which we'll talk about next, it's using uh, micro lenses to get to that place. Um, and that place is usually somewhere between 50 and 85% quantum efficiency, depending on where it is. Um, so you might say, well, that's great. Why do we need anything more than this? 85% is, is pretty good. Um, but there's a few downsides to doing this as well. Um, one of the downsides is that, of course, we love to have 100% in a perfect world, right? 
every photon counts. And beyond that, there's sort of advanced techniques I'll talk about that we can do with the sensors, um, such as putting special coatings on the sensor to enhance their performance in certain areas of the, of the visible spectrum, um, certain types of sensor conduct construction we'd want to do that will destroy the micro lens that's on there. Um, and so the micro lens gets away based in the way of all these processes, basically, where you want to do something to the surface of the CCD after it's been constructed, because any alteration of the surface then is going to interfere with the micro lenses. So there's another way. So in the again, this was developed as far as I know, I think theoretically in the 70s is probably the first time these sensors were developed, maybe even before the microlensing technology. Um, <clears throat> you have a type of sensor called back illuminated sensors. And the reason it's called back illuminated, and some people will say backside illuminated or backside. Anytime you see back in front of the word sensor, you're probably talking about the same thing. So here's that same depleted region that's active. And you'll notice this little thin blue line below it. That's the electrode structure. So the electrode structure that's maintaining the current across the pixel, making the pixel work, is now on the other side. Pretty cool. That means it makes it kind of tricky to run the chip in a lot of cases. You have to do your electronics a lot differently. There's some other challenges. But the big benefit of this is now there's nothing in the way of the pixel. The pixel is straight up able you know, to be more or less perfectly exposed to the outside world. There's tricky processes that do this. Right now at E2V, which is where this process is done at Teledyne, we use a laser annealing process. Um, you can imagine taking a laser and kind of shaving away the silicon until it's thin enough to work. Originally, people did this by hand using you know, fluorinated acids to etch away over a certain period of time. Peter's smiling because he can probably imagine how tricky that is. And, and these kind of acids are not fun to work with either. And in some places still do that. Um, so, but the goal is to thin this silicon enough that now, you know, it's the right depth for what you want and more or less able to active, you know, image, you know, the, the incident photons on it. When you do this, I realized a little too late to change it in my talk. This isn't the greatest uh, example. We'll have better ones in a second. But essentially, the quantum efficiency doubles from a front illuminated chip. So, and a lot of the detectors you guys are dealing with now, even relatively inexpensive ones, are back illuminated in the astronomy world. And that's because this is really the best way to get super high quantum efficiencies. We're talking in the 90 plus percentile range where 95 out of 100 photons incident in the sensor are detected. Um, because we don't live in a perfect world, you know, we, we can't really get 99.9, never quite gets that high. There's always a little bit of reflectance. And that's simply due to the, the change in numerical aperture from the silicon to the air. Whenever you change surfaces, whether it's glass, air, silicon, some of the light is sort of naturally reflected because of the change in numerical aperture. That happens when light goes into silicon. And that's why you don't get 100%. There's this little drop um, due to that change in numerical aperture. So one more um, sort of innovation in this space that we'll talk about. And this might be familiar to astronomers. If not, we'll talk about this. This is something that uh, you may not have heard about before. There's yet another type of process that results in something called a deep depletion CCD. Um, you might notice, if you look at this previous one here, that the quantum efficiency really falls off you know, the, end, the end of the world above 900. You can go from 95% at 1,000, you might be down at 5 or 8 or 10%. So you get a huge reduction in quantum efficiency as you push further out in the spectrum. And a lot of astronomers are trying to push further out into this, into this spectrum now. You know, if you're in depending on which narrowband filters you use, there's some that are of great interest above 800 and 900, right? And you'll notice the quantum efficiency goes way down. And not only does it go way down, you encounter another problem called etaloning, where you get a kind of constructive interference on the CCD that produces this kind of moiré pattern that, that I'll show you in a second. So you might say, well, okay, okay, Mick, we want to go higher. We don't want this etaloning. What do we do? 
the, the typical answer nowadays is to use a deep depletion CCD. So this is another type of CCD <clears throat> where the depleted region is still active, can still maintain its charge, but is essentially super thick and much thicker than on a standard back illuminated CCD. So what this does, the depth of the pixel is proportional to the chance that a photon that hits it will become an electron. So when you make this layer thicker, right, the photon has to go further through it in order to make it to the other side and not be detected. Um, so what happens is these weak photons, right? If we remember, if you remember your physics, the higher you go in wavelength, the lower the energy of the photon incident on the sensor. Um, it's an interesting little factoid I'll, I'll throw out that if you go really low, really low in the UV, you can generate multiple electrons with a single photon incident on the sensor because the energy is so high. You have the opposite problem in the near IR. The reason that in the near IR that QE falls off is because these photons are really weak, too weak in a lot of cases to generate the electron that we're detecting. So if you use a deep depletion CCD, the photon has to sort of travel further. It's like playing a game of tag where it has to run past more of your you know, guys in the gym before it gets to the other side without getting tagged. And you improve the QE, which I'll show you in a second. But this is an example of uh, that etaloning phenomenon I talked about. Any of you on the call that might be looking at doing spectroscopy, especially in the near IR, um, this is actually a spectrum that we're showing here that's taken with a standard back illuminated CCD on kind of a white light source, but the source is irrelevant. The wavelength is what matters. And you'll notice that in the data, there's this kind of ringing that you see above 700 nanometers. If you look at the image, that produces this kind of pattern that you see on the bottom images on the left side here, where it, above where it says spec 10 400B. <clears throat> and you'll notice that this problem gets worse the higher you go in wavelength. The only reason <clears throat> it looks better above 900 is that the sensitivity of the system falls off so much because of the low QE that you don't see it. So if you look on the right side, we now have a deep depletion CCD. And you'll notice that this pattern on the bottom images, exact same conditions as the left side, but now that pattern is more or less completely gone. You still see a little pattern noise from the sensor and the light source in this case, but that moiré pattern, which is what we're concerned about, is gone. And if you look at the data, you know there's a little bit of noise at times, but it's not this ringing, right? It's a dramatic improvement. So this deep depletion technology is what's used, you know, a lot of the sort of professional astronomers, if you're pushing into the near IR, like a lot of them are, um, you know, this, this is the kind of technology that they're after. We just, you know, for any of you who might be in Utah, I was just up there setting up one of these cameras for uh, Utah State up there for their observatory at Bear Lake. So it's, I wanna make sure everyone's aware of it. It's, you know, it, it adds to the cost of the chip, but if you wanna push it up there, I want to make sure everybody knows kind of the technologies that are available. The other thing that's a little further on that's kind of interesting is we always think of AR coatings um, on sunglasses, right? Everybody thinks about, okay, I want AR coating on my sunglass or my regular glasses to prevent reflection. And what an AR coating does is prevent this issue I talked about earlier, where you get a numerical aperture change and you reflect away some of the light. What an anti-reflective surface does is essentially transition that numerical aperture very slowly through a large number of steps. So there's a coating, which almost matches the numerical aperture of the air, in this case, the substrate you wanna go, and then it steps it down a little bit at a time until you get to the numerical aperture of the glass or the polycarbonate or whatever it is on the other side that you're going through. And that actually prevents a lot of the light from reflecting away. You lose about 7% of light when you hit a glass surface. With an AR coating, you don't lose this. The same thing is true, if it turns out, on silicon. So there are a few ways to do this. Most of you are probably using cooled cameras. Um, cooled cameras, whenever you see that quantum efficiency curve for any camera, and this is true for us, it's true for you know 
fill in your favorite camera company, no matter who's you look at, what they're showing you is the quantum efficiency of the sensor measured kind of in a vacuum on its own. These are typically measured in a device called a QE station at the manufacturer without anything else in front of it. But that's not the way we use it. When you use the sensor, it's typically in a cooled package because when you're doing astronomy, you want low dark current, you want the ability to take long exposures. That means that the sensor is typically cooled. And so it's in a, a vacuum package and has a glass window. On the right side of this, this slide, you can see I've got a few of our um, all metal constructed windows here with at the very front, you can see the little glass window in the front of the sensor. And so here's, here's the interesting point I'm getting to. That is that if you don't have any coding on that window, you wind up with this black line that you see right here. About five to 6% of the photons are reflected away by that glass surface. You can actually coat that window with a number of different things. The most common is this green line that we use here. This is a coating we developed in-house, but other places may do similar things. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but that allows you to lose very little of the incoming light. You know, Now, instead of losing 7%, you're cutting that loss in half or even better. And then you're also seeing there's some specialized coatings, such as magnesium fluoride and other materials, if you want to make this a little biased towards either the near IR or the UV. The other thing that can be done, and my guess is most people here know of e Teledyne E2V. Um, E2V is one of the world's foremost manufacturers of scientific grade CCDs. And they've invented processes whereby you can actually coat um, the CCD itself in order to improve the quantum efficiency beyond what's possible with standard back illumination or even deep depletion. We actually have a, a sort of advanced version of this process we call Exelon that's again focused on the near IR because that's, that's where it's hard. What you see on this curve, this dotted line is a deep depletion sensor that one might use you know, for near IR observations. In the red line here is the same sensor, but it's been, it's been treated with the Exelon process that we do. You'll notice not only does it push it further out into the near IR, but it also, in this case, dramatically improves the deep depletion chip's performance with higher energy photons that are incident on it. So you get kind of a broader, better overall, better overall QE curve than you normally would. So we'll kind of put it all together um, <clears throat> with this one enormous slide um, that, that has curves for basically the exact same sensor with the various treatment processes and construction types that we just talked about. So just for reference, <clears throat> this happens to be an E2V 1024 by 1024 13 micron pixel um, sensor, one that's commonly used in astronomy, um, or at least used to commonly be used in astronomy before we went to much larger sensor arrays. But the same curves hold for just about any CCD you were to throw at it. And I'll just kind of run through, right? We start out with front illuminated sensors here. And if you'll notice, let's look at 550 to 600 common visible, we're at about 35% quantum efficiency. The B, um, which is this dotted green line, is our sort of next enhancement. Let's say we make a back illuminated sensor. Now you'll notice QE goes from 35% all the way up to 95%. And what that means is just going to this back illuminated sensor, you're going to get three times the signal that you otherwise would with the front illuminated sensor. Um, and if you have a ton of photons coming in, a lot of signal, it won't matter so much. But we're astronomers. We never have a lot of signal, at least not in my case, that's not for me. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's times when you have plenty of signal, but those are usually rare, right? Unless we're looking at the moon or you're looking at the sun, something like that, right? The more interesting things are always signal limited. And so getting three times the signal with everything else being equal is a huge improvement. Um, and then we get to some variants. This solid green line is the same back illuminated sensor, but now treated with the Exelon process I, met, I mentioned earlier. You'll notice it pushes the near IR further in the green, 
And if we measured etaloning on this, it would be greatly reduced. These red lines are the deep depletion sensor I talked about. These are like the near IR specialists. If you wanna see things that you actually can't see with the naked eye because everything above, interesting, another little interesting factoid, um, people's eyes are a little different. There's some uh, recessive mutations that allow you to see further out. So some people can see up to about 780, 800 nanometers. Most people can only see up to about 750. Um, <clears throat> so everything above 800 is invisible. So all what we're talking about here are things that you couldn't actually see, but that your telescope can see. And in, in the case of a deep depletion sensor, your sensor can see. So if we look at 1,000 nanometers or even nine, 950, which is a good one, 950, you're at 70% QE with one of these deep depletions versus even, you know, this exotic back illuminated technology gets you half as far in the near AR. And then <clears throat> finally, there are other processes. My guess is most people here aren't going to be super interested in the UV, but you'll notice that there's a number of processes we can use. <clears throat> this BUV process is one that's done at the silicon foundry. These other dashed lines are ones that we can do in-house with coatings to boost the quantum efficiency of the sensor in the UV if you want to look at those highly energetic photons. So I noticed when I was at the Advanced Imaging Con Conference that people really liked some of the math that went on. So I figured, well, we'll, we'll put a little math in at the end. And uh, you know, we'll actually do another, another seminar on how to do these calculations yourself if you want to. So for now, I'm not going to focus on that in too much detail. You'll you can kind of check them after the fact if you want to look at my equations, or you can trust me that I did it right in this case, which hopefully your faith isn't misplaced. There's this equation right here, which is pretty cool. This allows you, given the known parameters for any camera system, it's kind of nice. If you have a telescope or a microscope or any optical system, you really know on the other side of it, it's characterized. It doesn't change. It's not like the real world where anything can happen from one moment to the next that alters the amount of light coming or going from a certain place. But when you're looking at a defined system like we're used to dealing with, we can define all of the all of the important parameters. You know, the purists, the physicists here might point out that there's probably a hundred other variables we could plug in, but those variables are all very small in contribution to the ones that we're going to look at. So they're essentially negligible for the purposes of this calculation. And this allows you to figure out your signal to noise ratio. You know, your signal is the amount of photons incident. And really what affects that signal, right? The top term is basically the incident photons times the time times the quantum efficiency, right? And that makes sense. If you have 100 photons hitting a sample, for example, like in the sample, the example I've got here, and let's say you got a front side illuminated detector that has a 50% quantum efficiency, you're going to pick up half of those photons. 50% are reflected, reflected away, 50% are detected. Um, since we're focusing on quantum efficiency here, the signal is actually part of the noise part of the equation. This bottom part of the equation is noise, and it's essentially read noise, which is a function of the electronics in the camera primarily, the dark noise, which is a function of the sensor, the electronics, and the temperature that it runs at. And then something called shot noise, which is the sort of inherent, I, I think of it as the inherent unpredictability of photons. Photons will sometimes just exit the side of the telescope because they feel like it. And you would think that shouldn't happen, but at a quantum mechanical level, it does. So when we start dealing with small numbers of photons, 100, 10, even 1,000, you know, photons incident on a pixel, which is pretty common. If you're doing astronomy and you've got a noisy image, you know, depends on the camera, but in a lot of cases, that noisy image almost certainly means you've got 100 photons or less hitting the pixel. So you're kind of entering the world of quantum mechanics in a weird way. Um, but, but that being said, that unpredictability plays a role <clears throat> in the overall noise equation. And if we do this calculation in my little example here, I've got 100 photons incident on the detector, which is kind of on the low side. Um, you wind up with a signal to noise ratio of about five to one, 5.3 to one. So for sake of this discussion, 
let's take the exact same sensor. So I've kept all the other equation parameters the same, and all I've changed is to go from 50% quantum efficiency to 95% quantum efficiency, pretending we've got a back illuminated detector. How would this affect our signal to noise ratio in a real world example, where we've got dark current contributing, we've got read noise contributing, just like you would in a real scenario, right? Normally, you don't just have quantum efficiency contributing to your overall signal to noise. In this case, our signal to noise goes from 5.3 to 8.2. And what that looks like, just for sake of, uh, you know, kind of example, I, I took a few different star fields with different signal to noise ratios. So here is a two to one signal to noise ratio. And it looks a little bit like a snowball in a snowstorm. That's how I think about it. By the time you get up to five, you're starting to see this. And some of the dim objects like this guy on the left side here can start to pop out. And that's what you're gonna see with the front illuminated detector in this scenario is gonna be close to that. And with the backside illuminated detector, you're gonna get more like the image on the right. And this dim object now starts to pop out. You start to see some detail on the smaller ones. And this is only gonna get better the longer you go. The advantage that you have with the dark side, I mean, with the back illuminated detector is going to increase the longer the exposure time you do. So a little bit of a real world example. Um, that's about it for the science side. Um, I'll just give a little bit of plug to uh, our products, just so you guys know, you probably know that we do make cameras. Um, in this case, in a lot of cases, we make the detectors and my PowerPoint has a mind of its own. Um, Woodland Hills handles these for us and would be happy to tell you more if you actually wanted to see one on, on one of your systems. You know, we do do loans. So if you wanna play with one, we're happy to help with that. We're very science oriented, you know? You can get the same technology on your scope that NASA uses. Most everything we've made and most of these sensors are spin-offs from larger projects that we've done. This camera over here, you see the Sophia, for example, was originally built for NASA for the for Sophia project. And it makes a pretty nice platform for astronomy. Um, everything we make has a lifetime vacuum warranty and we are a US company. So if uh, you wanna deal with people in the US, you know, that's us. We make a few scientific CMOS cameras, and I'll just show a few here. Um, all these are, are generally backside illuminated, 95% QE, extremely low read noise. And the latest one, this Kinetics, I'll highlight a little bit, is pretty awesome. It can do nine megapixels, about 10, I guess, when you add up the, the remainders, and it'll go 500 frames per second. You know, So you essentially get infinite speed. If you want to do things like exoplanet detection, if you really want to push the envelope for capturing, say, you know, meteor events, that kind of stuff, this guy works really well for that. This iris is a good example of a microlensed front illuminated detector. This one's a little less expensive, and this one uses microlenses on a front illuminated um, interline detector. If we want to move up our product range. You know, you get into the sort of pricier CCD-based ones. All of these use CCDs from E2V, um, all grade one. So these are sort of super high-end cameras with a price tag to match, but extremely low read noise and large pixels. So these are designed for, you know, telescopes that are around a one meter, you know, give or take a little bit. That's what I think Peter's an expert at, by the way, is matching the pixel size to the... Uh, to the size of the telescope. So we'll, we'll wind up doing that topic down the road for those interested. And then I'll just do a little plug for this guy because it's pretty exciting. We just debuted this at the SPIE Astronomical Telescopes meeting a few weeks ago for the first time. Um, this is an entirely new sensor that we fabricated just for astronomy called LACERA. And it's originally gonna be used at some new observatories being commissioned, but it'll be released into the wild in 2023, so to speak. And we'll have it in 3K by 3K, um, 6K by 6K, and then the big guy, um, you know, 9K by 9K or 8K by 8K. So up to 64 megapixels. It's got a relatively large pixel, but 95% QE, less than one electron read noise. And we didn't talk about it in this because we're focused on QE, but CMOS sensors tend to accumulate a glow if you do sit and stare. And this camera is designed specifically not to have that glow. So it's kind of an ideal sensor for astronomy. 
And this guy will start shipping in 2023. So that's it for the product plug. Thank you for your forbearance in advance. Now I'll uh, be happy to answer any questions. I was going to ask about, I'm sure a, a couple of questions will be regarding software. You may want to kind of uh, open up a little bit about ASCOM compliant. Um, any other, if, if you've got, Teledyne has their own software, but that definitely just uh, give the, uh, the collective group uh, uh, an understanding about that. Yeah, we do. Um, so in general, all of our stuff supports Linux, is ASCOM compliant, um, as well as Windows compliant. And so we also support a number of open source software packages, and we do have our own software package as well that runs most of the cameras. There's a few exceptions for, for various reasons, but in general, all those things are, are true. And then in terms of binning, um, do you have the capability of doing a hardware and software binning? It depends on the sensor. So binning is something that the electronics on the sensor determine and will be the subject of a future, uh, future discussion here. Uh, yeah. But that being said, <laughs> essentially the, the short version of that answer is that on CCDs we make, and this is a function of both the sensor and the electronics that we implement, you can do infinite binning. So for example, if you imagine there's a CCD and it's a 1000 by 1000 CCD, you could bin that all the way down to one giant pixel, you know, where you have one pixel running at an insane frame rate, um, you know, thousands of Hertz, just doing photometry essentially. Yeah. And you can then, you know, switch in software and be at 1K by 1K again in a heartbeat. Um, that's one of the advantages of CCDs is that you have the flexibility of true binning because binning improves the speed and sensitivity um, because you actually, if you do a two by two bin, four pixels combined, you get four times the signal with the same noise. So you get a four X signal to noise improvement. Mm -hmm. So it lets you trade resolution for signal to noise. That's why people want it. For CMOS cameras, the general rule, because of the way the architecture of a CMOS chip is, CMOS chips can't do binning. Any, any binning that they do is, is fake in a certain sense. You can bin on the FPGA, you can bin in software, and you can get a resulting image that's smaller, um, but you don't gain the benefit of speed increase or signal to noise increase that you do with a CCD. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and just one last question that I have is, is maybe um, detailed to the collective group, but you and I had discussed about this being the first of maybe a series of talks. That is a good cue. Um, I kind of missed my cue with that. So we'll go back here. And <clears throat> yeah, so I kind of glossed over the last slide. Yep. We're planning to do the next one in the series for those interested in dynamic range. So the, the title is going to be dynamic range and why your camera is a liar. Um, and we're going to do that on the 14th. So we'll talk about where dynamic range comes from. We'll actually show you how to calculate it. And we'll kind of get into the same nitty gritty at the base of the sensor that we did with this in a general way so that you can intelligently, like my goal is at the end of it, anyone will be able to actually figure out what the dynamic range of their camera truly is, regardless of what the spec sheet says. Yeah, that, that's a really good question, Simon. <laughs> and it's something we deal with fairly often with customers. The situation in reality is actually worse than you described because there's another factor I left out. Um, so in general, most of the manufacturers provide the QE curve as a relative QE curve. So they don't give you an absolute quantum efficiency. They give you a relative quantum efficiency. And you might say relative to what, right? <laughs> that's the real question. And so what most manufacturers do, I, I shouldn't say most, but yeah, I think I can say most. I think that's a safe, safe assumption. What most manufacturers do is sort of theoretically model and say, okay, relative to this, if the highest point on the curve is probably this percentage based on the theoretical model for the CCD, you then fit that curve to that percentage. And that curve won't take into account in that case, the, uh, you know, the QE of anything in front of the sensor, such as the cover window, like I talked about. So what you're getting in that case is an approximation of what the QE should be based on the manufacturer's spec and then an extrapolation from that. Um, and it's usually ballpark, you know, it, it's not gonna be wrong in the sense that if it says it's half as much at 400, because of that method, 
probably is about half as much at 400. But in my experience, people tend to fudge to the high side on the, the top of that spectrum, you know. Um, the other way to do it is to have this device called the QE station, where you actually set up the sensor, or in some cases, the whole camera, in this kind of spherical ball that captures all of the incident radiation and refocuses it down onto the sensor. And you can then measure how much of it isn't captured. It's, it's kind of a cool device, it's kind of expensive. Um, the only people who generally own those are ones who are characterizing sensors, you know? Or if you're really careful in your camera construction, so for example, if I wanna call out someone I know is a good actor, Hamamatsu, for example, does this routinely with all their devices. You know, and if you measure it that way with a QE station, then the number you're getting is actually absolute. It's an absolute quantifiable number. So a lot of it really comes down to the reputation of the, uh, of the place doing it and how carefully you know, they're measuring it. Um, and is, you have to ask yourself, is, is the data sheet I'm looking at a marketing document or a technical document? If it's a technical document, it's gonna be pretty close. If it's a marketing document, could be, it can be substantially different than what you observe. If you're doing DSOs, anything where you're light limited, as we went through in that example, the QE is actually, you, you can go through that equation and we'll do more on how to do these calculations in a future, future series. But for now, just take my word for it. The, the QE is the single largest influence on the signal to noise in that equation. So if you ask me, you know, you look at it, if you look at the QE of detector A, and detector B, right? Um, if everything else is identical, so let's just say for sake of this discussion, and this is what makes it complicated is everything else is never identical. But since we're gonna focus on QE, if everything else is identical, you can easily collect two to three times as many photons with no changes except for a higher quantum efficiency. And, you know, you're not going to easily double your light collection efficiency in the telescope, right? With adding one little additional optic, but you can easily double the light collection efficiency of the detector um, just by going from say a front side illuminated to a back side illuminated detector with everything else being equal. So, you know, for me personally, I think focusing on the, the QE of the detector first and foremost, if you're looking at faint objects is, is the number one thing to do. It's gonna, it's gonna give you more bang for the buck than practically anything else. And that's why we kind of led with this in the, the lecture series. You know, it's not, it may seem like we're down in the weeds in this talk, but this is really high quantum efficiency is center plate. The other really important thing to think about is if you're looking at narrow band filters, where does that narrow band filter fall on the QE curve of the camera, right? If you're looking at, you know, if you look at these QE curves here, <clears throat> And I'll just go back and expand on this a tiny bit more. You know, if you're looking at a narrow band filter that's at 800 with this deep depletion sensor type, you'd be at like 99% quantum efficiency. And if we looked at, you know, the same thing with a back luminated detector, we'd be at, you know, around 50% quantum efficiency at 900. So, you know, knowing where your narrow band filter falls on this curve is, is a critical thing to consider as well. Uh, Mick, looks like we have a question from uh, Raymond. Hey, and Raymond. Does the deep depletion technology help with reflection, collection from other surfaces in the light path, Newtonian <clears throat> rings, or just from the sensor itself? That's another great question. That's like an advanced optical question. A lot, I mean, astronomers think about these things. Not everyone does, which is cool, <laughs> you know? which is like, you got a couple of stray photons bouncing around in there. Can you see them? The answer is yes. They do come back and they come back in the wrong place always. So I'll, I'll give a little more general answer. Um, the, an the short answer is yes, but the big question is why. Um, and so the why is that any improvement in quantum efficiency results in more absorbed photons and fewer reflected photons bouncing around. So this is kind of a fringe benefit of quantum efficiency, right? Is that you don't reflect away those photons to then bounce around and come back onto a different spot on the detector, which the detector just thinks is signal, you know, and collects it accordingly. But on your image, it's going to look like noise because now you've got photons that are in the wrong place. 
So any, any type of improvement in the sensor quantum efficiency, whether it's deep depletion for the near IR or even back luminated in the visible, is going to absorb more photons and result in fewer reflections. Now, now that being said, uh, I'll just point out one other thing, and that is a lot of the reflections that you, you see at times, you know, if, if the reflection is orders of magnitude above what we're talking about, you still get some small reflection, right? If the reflection is enormous, reducing it by 90%, you know, 90, 10% of enormous is still enormous, right? So where this makes a difference is for chasing down the smaller stuff, not necessarily large, larger problems. Uh, looks like uh, Jose has said, thanks, Teledyne, and thanks, uh, Woodland yep. Hills. Uh, there's a lot of good information. And uh, are your slides available for future reference? Yes, um, this particular um, uh, presentation is being recorded, and I'm sure that we're going to be able to have that posted here on the website uh, shortly. But uh, as, as we're talking about, this is just maybe this beginning of a series of little presentations that uh, Mick has been very kind to be able to kind of assist us with. And so we'll definitely be recording all of these. Um, is there any other questions that any of the collective group has? I'll just add further. Um, I'm happy to share the slide deck in Toto, just as a slide deck too. So if you want that, um, but I, I'd rather not just totally release it into the wild, um, so to speak. So if you want a copy of the slide deck, just drop an email to Peter and we'll get it out to you. Yeah. And uh, just for that, uh, just my email address is just peter at telescopes.net. Is there any other questions? Um, don't see any written here. I'm hoping we still have how many 18 participants. So uh, please uh, don't be bashful, post your questions. <laughs> no, that's that's all good. So I appreciate everyone's time. Hopefully it's been helpful. And if, if you want, also please feel free afterwards to give us any constructive criticism or feedback because it'll only help me uh, you know, improve things for the next one. So thanks everyone. Absolutely. Uh, well, I think, Mick, I think that's about it. Um, just want to thank uh, you and, and, and thank the collective group here that definitely stayed to watch the presentation. And our next presentation is going to be September 14th. And we'll definitely um, send out the link to that as well. So in the near future, but to everybody, thank you very much for showing up and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you.